welcome everyone to the first Golden Zoomies uh, call. And really the purpose of this is so you can meet the scientists working on the study. We don't often get to talk to you directly and we'd like to do that more often from now on so that you really know what's going on with the study and what we're doing. Uh, thank you everyone who sent us questions. We have kind of grouped them into topics. Uh, and obviously our topic today overall is aging dogs. Uh, so first I'm just gonna introduce myself. I am not alone today. I'm joined by two of our scientific colleagues. My name is Janet Patterson Kane, and I am the Chief Scientific Officer of the Morris Animal Foundation. I am a veterinarian and I'm from New Zealand originally. So uh, I hope you enjoy the accent. Uh, I can't seem to get rid of it, but I am uh, sitting in Denver, Colorado. I'm a pathologist in terms of my training and I became board certified uh, work, working here at the University of Florida and then the University of Kentucky. And then I had about a 15 year academic career. I have a PhD in tendon and ligament biology. So I'm gonna be talking about osteoarthritis today, which is one of my uh, favorite topics. Uh, and my academic career was spent in London, uh, a few years in Australia and in Scotland before I uh, moved into the private sector back in the States uh, again. And I then about four years ago, joined one of the scientific review boards for the foundation and became CSO a couple of years ago. And I would genuinely say that the main reason I took this job is because of the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. This is a very important study scientifically. And I just want to thank all of the participants and veterinarians, because you really are the study and none of this would happen without you. Before I hand over, I'd like to apologize for any animal noises that may occur in the background. Uh, I have two 18 month uh, old cats who came from a shelter, Miller and Pushkin, sometimes start meowing outside the door. I have a five-year-old husky lab cross called Ella. She was a single mother from Texas, and when her puppies were adopted, she joined our household. I'm going to talk about her a bit later. And we have Paisley. She is a pandemic puppy, I'm afraid. So uh, I took the opportunity, and she's a seven-month-old border collie who's very cute, but she's a teenager, so she's pretty annoying right now as well. Uh, so just going to hand over to Julia to introduce yourself. Hi everyone, um, my name is Julia Labadee. I am the veterinary epidemiologist for the girls study. I started last May, so I've been around for about nine months now. Um, I did my veterinary and PhD training at Colorado State University. Um, for my PhD, I actually studied lymphoma in golden retrievers as part of what I called the golden year study. And I know that some of you actually participated in that. So thank you for that. Um, I have had goldens my whole life and have a senior golden now who's actually um, pictured in my background and laying on the floor at my feet. Um, so I'm really passionate about the study and the impact that it'll have on dogs everywhere. Um, and then I think Kathy is next to introduce yourself. Yes. Hi, I'm Kathy TG, and I'm the Vice President of Scientific Operations at the Morris Animal Foundation. I'm really pleased to be the Operations Director for the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. In my background, I have a PhD in clinical science and spent the first part of my career doing human cancer research. I also have a master's in business administration and really enjoy the challenge that lies at the intersection of science and business management. So since Janet and Julie have talked about their, um, their pets, I do have a COVID puppy as well. He is a German short hair pointer who will be a year old pretty soon. And um, he is, he's really a delight and keeps me extremely active. Um, so when I began working on the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study about two years ago, I really uh, immediately came to appreciate the unique and groundbreaking potential of this study. And I'm just really humbled by the commitment and determination of all of the dog owners, the veterinarians, and the volunteers who've been involved really much longer than me. You've all built something super amazing, and it's my honor to give you a brief study update and then introduce our topics for today. So if you've been counting, you'll know that 2021 
marks the ninth year of the study. And the average age of the dogs in our study is eight years old this year. To date, we've accrued about 35% of our primary endpoints. And our primary endpoints are defined as four specific types of cancer. Now, sadly, as most of you know, hemangiosarcoma and lymphoma represent a majority of those endpoints. And this is where we need to have patients a bit and emphasize that the nature of a longitudinal study requires us to observe the dogs over their lifetime. And so even though we've accrued 35% of our endpoints, we still require more time and more cases to draw statistically significant conclusions about associations between these cancers and other factors like genetics and lifestyle. We also need to bear in mind that about half the golden retrievers in our cohort will not get cancer, which really brings us to focus today on how we can support healthy aging in this cohort. I'm now gonna turn things over back to Janet and she is going to answer some of the questions that came through about uh, aging dogs and geriatric veterinary medicine. Janet? All right, sorry, a few seconds there because we've got someone muting and unmuting us here. Uh, so we really want to talk about life stage here. Um, you know, our dogs are now becoming older and aging. And so where are we at? If we talk about people and use that word geriatric, uh, it's generally applied to people over the age of 65. However, you know, many people in society such as ours don't need geriatric expertise in their, career, in their care until they're maybe 70 or 75 or even 80. People can be quite different in that respect. And when we look at dogs, obviously we've got dogs from Chihuahuas to Great Danes, so uh, they age very differently. You wouldn't be surprised to meet a 20-year-old Chihuahua. You would be very surprised indeed to find a golden retriever that age, although it has happened. So the American Veterinary Medical Association uh, if we look at these ages, if we look at a dog that's seven years of age and that dog is large to very large, so that's where our retrievers are falling, a dog of seven years would be somewhere in the human equivalent of 50 to 56. If we get to 10 years, where some of our dogs are now in the study, they would be in human equivalent somewhere between 66 and 78. And if we looked at a 15-year-old golden retriever, if we were lucky enough to get there, and I have met them, uh, so 15-year-old would be somewhere between 93 and 115 human equivalents. And I see someone on the chat, uh, Chris says that Dixie turned 17 yesterday. So Dixie is way up there in, turn, in terms of age. So if we think about this, a lot happens in a year uh, with an aging dog. You know, this could be equivalent to what happens in five to 10 years for a person. And the other thing to really bear in mind is, of course, your chronological age is not the same as your biological. So some people and dogs age much more quickly and some much more slowly. One thing I will say that with my own dogs, I found myself doing is when they get to seven or eight, I go into complete denial and I just keep them at seven or eight in my mind. And that is probably not a good approach. So it's, it's good to be very, very aware of where your dog's at and that things will be changing quite quickly. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Julia, who is still a practicing uh, veterinary surgeon. And she's going to talk a little bit about uh, keeping older dogs and what the veterinary care should look like. So as um, Janet mentioned, aging dogs do face uh, many of the same health concerns that we do. And since they age more rapidly than us, um, it's really ideal, I believe, to have twice annual veterinary visits for our senior dogs so that we can just better detect and treat any diseases early. Um, a senior vet visit is much like a regular vet visit, except I often am trying to probe a little bit more with owners about any subtle changes that they might just not bring up on their own. 
Um, I'm not going to go into specifics about potential diagnoses based on these things because any one change could be due to multiple underlying processes. Um, but I just want to highlight some of the things that you can keep an eye on at home and make sure to talk to your vet about. Um, as I mentioned, I have a senior dog, um, so I know how hard it can be to recognize some of these subtle changes since you're spending day in and day out with them. And as Janet mentioned, I also know that there's a huge component of denial that can come with the fact that our dogs are seniors. Um, and so having some concrete measures um, can be really helpful for, for me at least. Um, so for a senior vet visit, I am always asking about um, history and history gathering is really important. And so you guys have been doing this for a long time. And so I know that sort of general health questions are pretty second nature to you. So things like any changes in thirst or appetite, um, urination or defecation, um, especially important in seniors is if they're having accidents in the house and that's new to them, that might, that's definitely something to bring up. Um, we're already always checking for bad breath or any concerns about dental care, like dropping food. Um, a lot of times with senior pets, I'm hearing things like um, they're worried about their vision or their hearing. And so making sure to bring that up. Um, and senior dogs were often seeing a difference in sort of their weight distribution. So as they're getting less active, sometimes we're losing muscles and we're gaining weight. And so we wanna make sure that we're keeping an eye out for those changes. Um, and changes in breathing. So things like, is your dog panting more? Um, have they developed a cough? Or something that I often hear in seniors is that the, the sound of their bark has changed and that can be a sign of some underlying disease processes. Um, as golden owners, I think we're pretty well versed in always monitoring for any lumps and bumps. Um, so continuing to do that throughout age. And a lot of times with age, we're getting a lot more of these benign lumps and bumps, but we still wanna make sure we're always getting those checked. Um, Janet will talk a bit more later about behavior changes that we can see in older dogs, but I just wanted to touch on that now. Um, a lot of times as we're losing hearing, we can see a decreased response to sound, but we can also see the opposite where dogs are now suddenly being reactive to sounds that they didn't care about before. And so making sure we mention that, um, we can see increased vocalization and that can be anything from um, whining or barking to, I've noticed that my dog now just groans a lot when she's laying down. Um, so that's something I'm keeping an eye on. Um, dogs that age can get more confused or disoriented. Um, so we can see things like um, repetitive pacing or wandering off. Um, we can also see any changes from just like slight ir irritability all the way up to overt aggression that's new for them. Um, and definitely we can see things like anxiety. Um, also changes in sleep cycle. So if they're now waking up at night and that's not normal for them, needing to go to the bathroom or just kind of waking up and being anxious. Um, decreased interaction with humans where they're kind of wanting to sleep more and not wanting to play with you as much um, or decreased response to commands, which is something that I'm definitely experiencing with my dog as well, where I'm like, are, do you not hear me? Do you hear me, but you're not processing the command or are you just being stubborn? And I still have yet to determine which of those three things it is. Um, we also often in senior dogs, and I know this was a common question that we got, is immobility and activity level. So we start seeing them sleeping more. We might notice them having difficulty getting up, um, witnessing stiffness or soreness, especially after exertion, um, decreased activity or interest in play. Licking or panting can definitely be signs of pain as well. Um, or just general sort of having a harder time getting around, like they can't jump into the car or onto your bed or couch if you let them on those things um, or climbing upstairs. So these are just things to keep an eye on and make sure that you're mentioning to your vet because it can help them sort of focus their exam um, and, and recommend diagnostic tests. And also just talking through options of, of what we can do to help keep your dog healthy, mobile and alert for as long as possible. So on the veterinary side, I always do a full comprehensive exam on all my patients, but in seniors, I'm sort of paying special attention to certain things. So um, their eyes and vision. So dogs get cloudiness just as a natural aging process, but I want to look closely at their eyes to make sure it's just the normal aging versus things like cataracts. Um, I'm always looking at their teeth and checking their ears. Cause sometimes if we have decreased hearing, it could actually be an ear infection. Um, I'm also, especially in Goldens, always checking all of their lymph nodes for any enlargement because I want to catch lymphoma early if that's a concern. 
um, an abdominal palpation where I'm kind of feeling their belly. It's not a perfect test, but I can often tell if their liver feels larger than normal or their spleen, or if there's an obvious mass, we definitely want to check that out. Um, I already mentioned lumps and bumps. Um, I always recommend doing cytology, which is where we poke that with a needle and then look at it under the microscope because you can't really tell from feeling things what they necessarily are. We can always make a guess, but, but it's really best to be able to look at it under the microscope to know for sure. I also listen to the heart and lungs for any changes um, and little dogs in particular, they often develop murmurs as they age, um, but older, but golden retrievers too can develop those. Um, and I always do a rectal exam in all of my patients for male dogs. We really want to make sure that they don't have any prostate enlargement or anything like that. And also golden retrievers are predisposed to anal sac cancer. And so I want to make sure I'm palpating for any masses there. And then back to mobility, um, doing a thorough orthopedic exam. And that includes me watching your dog walk away from me and back towards me, um, checking range of motion on every joint. So I'm flexing and extending every joint to feel if there's any crunchiness or decreased range of motion. Um, and I always palpate along the spine because a lot of times dogs, if they are, um, have, for example, hip pain, they compensate in their lower back. And so then they can get secondary lower back pain that we wanna make sure that we address as well. And Goldens, of course, are notoriously stoic and people pleasing. Um, so sometimes it can be really hard for me to detect pain back in the clinic because your Golden comes in and they're stoked to be there and meeting a new person and they're hiding all of their pain. So I really rely on owners to notify me of these subtle changes. And I also have some, some ways of playing detective when they really don't want to show me pain. And so things like looking at their toenails and paw pads. If a dog is off weighting a limb, its toenails might grow differently because they're not being worn down. And so I can notice things like that. Or if they're dragging their back feet, you can see drag marks on their toenails. So I do check things like that as well. Um, I always recommend routine wellness care for all of our dogs, no matter how old they are. And that'll depend on any other pre-existing conditions your dog has and what area you have and stuff like that. So I won't make specific recommendations. Um, I recommend full blood work. So a chemistry and a complete blood count twice a year in my senior patients, because I just want to make sure that we're catching things early. Blood work, of course, isn't perfect. We do have cases where a dog has cancer and they still have normal blood work, but there are a lot of things that we can catch early, like um, decreased function in liver or kidneys or anything like that. And so we just want to make sure that we're checking that regularly. I also recommend urinalysis at least once a year because um, older dogs can be more susceptible to things like urinary tract infections. And that also helps us monitor their kidney function. And I'm always, I still always recommend um, doing fecal floats in our senior dogs and doing heartworm tests and tick-borne disease panel. Um, we often sort of think of parasites as a problem in puppies, but older dogs can have a weakened immune system and that can make them um, harder to fight off parasites. So we wanna make sure we're checking that. Um, as dogs age, care really just gets more and more individualized based on sort of that, the, how fast they're aging, like Janet mentioned, um, and also just any other diseases they have present. So my dog is, I keep saying 11, but I think she's been 11 for a couple year now, years now, um, but she still will hike eight miles with me. And there are plenty of 11 year old dogs that can, are thrilled if they can get around the block. And so it's really hard to give generic advice about mobility. Um, but I just want to touch on some things about senior mobility in general, because I think that the old school frame of thought was sort of that once your dog gets older, you should just stop exercising them. And really that can do a lot of harm because as soon as they're not moving, they're losing muscle tone. So while I certainly wouldn't recommend um, taking a dog who's struggling to get around the block on an eight mile hike, um, I do think it's really important to maintain as much strength as possible in your senior dogs. And then just some general things about keeping them mobile as long as possible. I think first and foremost is keeping them a healthy weight. And so as dogs age, they can be less active and have a slower metabolism. And so they may require less calories. And so we need to make sure that we're adjusting their diet accordingly to that. Um, being overweight is a pro-inflammatory state. And so not only is it just more wear and tear on the joints because they're heavier, but it also can actually exacerbate pain that's already there. So uh, making sure that we're keeping dogs at a healthy weight, especially if they have any arthritis present can really help them. Um, and so there are certain 
diets for seniors that can be, um, that can reflect the fact that they might have a lower metabolism and also have like joint supplements and, and some brain health supplements in there as well. Um, so just something to talk to your vet about when it's time to switch diets um, and monitoring that. Keeping a consistently active lifestyle is also really important. And so that means slow, methodical progress. And so being a weekend warrior, which I've definitely been guilty of, can actually be more dangerous where my dog used to just sit on the couch all week and then we'd go on a huge hike on the weekend. And all that does is just cause a bunch of inflammation. It doesn't really help them have you know, stamina and build muscle over time. But the flip side is also bad where they, if they are just completely inactive, you can lose muscle tone really quickly. And if, if you don't use it, you lose it, you know? So uh, making sure that we're keeping them active as much as they tolerate is really important. Um, and, and going on walks and stuff is also just really important for men mental stimulation for your dogs, where they're smelling things, they're maybe meeting people that can help keep their brain healthy for longer as well. And this is, you know, listening to your dog. We don't want to be forcing dogs on walks if they're not capable, but if they're capable and happy, even if they're walking really slowly, just go their pace. Um, there's also a lot of things that we can do to sort of help out around the house as dogs are for dogs that have more severe disabilities. And so we can do things like feeding dogs on a raised platform so they don't have to strain their neck as much. There's orthopedic beds that are a little cozier for them. Um, we can add stairs and ramps throughout the house or carpet for attraction. So things like that, that you can talk to your vet about based on your dog's specific needs. I also think that we don't utilize um, rehab and physical therapy as much as we really should. Um, and these really can help increase muscle strength and range of motion and stamina with your dogs. Um, and so, for example, if they have arthritis in the stifle, we can really target that and make sure that we're increasing their quad and calf strength to help compensate for the, the stifle or knee being affected. And there's, and I think a lot of times we sort of think of this as some big ordeal that is going to be very time consuming, but there's actually a lot of small, really easy exercises that we can do to help strengthen a dog's hind end. And so I like to prescribe what's called doggy squats, which is basically you ask your dog to sit and then you ask it to stand again. And that makes them engage all of those muscles in the hind end. And you don't have to do this a lot. You can do it for five minutes twice a day and make a huge difference for, sorry, my dog's shaking, um, for a dog that is otherwise really inactive. You can also walk up hills, which helps engage their hind end as well. Um, and my favorite recommendation for dogs that are more severely recommend affected is um, booties on the hind legs. And booties are great because they, they give them some traction, but they're also great because if you've ever put booties on your dog, they pick their feet up really high for a while and walk goofy. And just that in itself is an exercise, right? Because they're having to really engage muscles to lift their feet up that high that they otherwise aren't using. So sometimes just putting on booties for five minutes twice a day just to make them pick their feet up and walk silly is enough of an exercise to really help strengthen a pretty weak older dog. There's also of course medications, which I think most people know about the options of having anti-inflammatories like um, Rimadyl or Galaprant. Um, we can do joint supplements or omega-3s um, or Adequin, which is an injectable joint protective compound. Um, so those are all options you can talk with your vet about, but I just really like to emphasize how much we can do aside from medications to just help keep our dogs strong and healthy um, longer. And so with that, I'll send you back to Janet to talk more about osteoarthritis. Actually, hold on a minute there, Julia. There's a few questions and things in the oh. chat, and there's one I think we can answer there. But uh, yes, Susan is saying she has Tessa, who's 14 years old, so doing very well there. Uh, and John says he has KN, of course, not in the girl study, is 15 and three quarters. Oh, um, oh, and she was very active until very close to the end, and they lost her last April. Oh. So very sorry to, to hear that. But that's, that's quite an age. I've, I've seen them at 16 or 17. Uh, there's a question here, Julia, that says, do you recommend having benign lumps removed for senior dogs? And I'm happy to give the pathologist viewpoint here. Uh, you certainly want to know what it is. And to some extent, it depends on where it is, because even a benign lump can grow and become a problem. I don't know if you would want to have some input there, Julia. Yep, I completely agree. So 
for like lipomas or the fatty tumors, I generally don't recommend having those removed as long as it's in a location where it's not affecting your dog's movement. So if it's like in their armpit and it's affecting their movement, then yes, we might want to get that removed. But if it's just kind of like on their back and it's not really affecting them at all, sometimes those can be um, kind of invasive to remove, even though but they're benign just because they can be big and have a lot of what we call dead space when we remove it. Um, so a lot of those I don't recommend getting removed. There are the, um, the dermal masses that a lot of dogs get. They're just, sort of, I call them old dog warts, but um, they're just kind of ugly little things that don't do much. But I have seen quite a few dogs where they kind of grow funny and then they scratch them and then they bleed. And so sometimes I'll recommend just taking those off at a routine dental cleaning or something like that just because they can get infected secondarily if they're bleeding like that. But usually I just monitor them for a while and we talk about removing them if they become a problem. Great, thank you very much. Uh, there's another question here, suggestions for cognitive support supplements. And there's a few questions there on nutrition. We're gonna try and have another one of these Zoomies, Zoomies calls on nutrition and we'll have uh, a nutritionist here. None of us are nutritionists. So I'll, I'll briefly mention a few things, but we probably won't go into that. And then a question from Doris, at least 12 of the golds in the studies have developed histiocytic sarcoma. Is this becoming more common in golden? So yes, we have 13 of them now. We were quite surprised by that. So we're now tracking that as a primary endpoint. So it's up there with lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, mast cell tumor and osteosarcoma. We're definitely keeping an eye. We'll be looking at those. We'll be looking at those dogs' uh, genetics as we get that data in. And I'll talk about the genotyping um, at the end there. Let me see. Yep. And the rest of those questions are on nutrition. So um, we'll do the nut nutrition later on in the year. Right. So uh, in the questions we had, we had several on the topic of arthritis. Uh, so we're getting into some science here. I just wanted to talk specifically about osteoarthritis. And osteoarthritis affects what we call synovial joints. Apologies for those of you who know the anatomy. I'm just going to go into that briefly. So synovial joints, which are the joints in our limbs, and there are some joints in the spine as well. It's basically a fluid-filled cavity, and we have the ends of the bones there. And at the end of each of those bones is a cartilage cap. So that's our shock-absorbing substance, and then the fluid in between them. Osteoarthritis starts when that cartilage starts to degenerate, and then it will gradually deteriorate. And so... Um, that's very bad for the joint because that's a kind of a slippery tissue that's enabling that joint to move without friction. There aren't any nerve endings in cartilage. So having things going on in the cartilage won't cause pain. Uh, however, ultimately, if the cartilage wears away completely, you can start weight bearing directly on bone. And that is a very serious situation where we really do have nerve endings. The tricky thing about joints is joints are very clever and complex structures. So the minute you get one component of the joint that's diseased, you start to get deterioration in everything else. Everything else kind of goes out of whack, as those of you who've had joint disease will no doubt appreciate. So we'll start to get changes in the bone. We'll start to get changes in the tendons and the ligaments there. Um, it will also cause inflammation of the synovium, which lines that fluid-filled cavity, and that in itself can actually cause pain. So osteoarthritis isn't the same as lameness. You can have osteoarthritis and not be lame, or the signs can be very subtle, uh, particularly when the disease first gets going. It's been estimated that at least 35% of all adult dogs have actually pain due to osteoarthritis. And it's thought that if we actually x-rayed all the dogs, it would be significantly higher than that. So it's probably the most common disease of dogs. Um, you might say dental disease is up there as well, but definitely very, very common. There's something else that's extremely important to know about osteoarthritis in dogs. So we in humans know that this is age-related, it's kind of a wear and tear disease, and it gets you know worse as we go on. In dogs, it is not an age-related disease. It is not just a disease of old dogs. 
it's actually mainly developmental. So things about the way that dog is made up. Uh, some dogs have hip dysplasia, for example, and that predisposes them to start developing osteoarthritis. So it can even be starting in puppies. And because the signs are initially quite subtle, uh, we'll, we'll find that the dogs are just coping with it and not letting us know. So as Julia was saying, golden retrievers and, and actually quite a few other dog breeds are really quite stoic. It can be very difficult to recognize this. So what we, we don't want to be in the situation where we realize our dog can't get up the stairs. That's osteoarthritis. It's really a long way down the road. What we want to do is intervene early. And that doesn't necessarily mean that your dog's going to be on pain medications for the rest of their life. Uh, but definitely denial is not good and picking these things up early is. So for example, my dog, Ella, who I mentioned before, she's about five years old and she is showing some subtle signs uh, of some issues in her joints. So she has been pretty reluctant to jump up in the car. There's just a few things about the way she walks that are noticeable. So we got some weight off her. They tend to get into a vicious cycle of not wanting to be active, putting on weight, and then they become even less active. So getting that weight off made a huge difference. And we're getting her to see a, a physical therapist. Actually just seeing at the moment, because she's so anxious, we're just getting her used to going to the office of the physical therapist. And hopefully we'll get onto some treatment. So this will be different for each dog, but I just wanted to put it in your mind that this is not actually an old dog disease. And that if your dog is in pain, and particularly if you don't, really know this, uh, can have all sorts of effects on the way your dog is interacting with you and other dogs, on your dog's ability to think properly. I'll talk about cognition a little bit later. So golden retrievers are stoic. We want to be finding these things if they're going on. So how do we detect things early and how do we monitor what is going on? Well, there are some great tools right now, and we're going to make these tools available to you. Uh, so, Julia, if you'd like to come back on and tell everyone what's coming. Yes. Um, so since so many of you have really expressed interest in osteoarthritis and helping keep your heroes mobile, um, we've been doing a lot of research into tools that can help both you and your vet uh, monitor your dog's mobility. And so we're really excited about this. And we think that it'll be really valuable to have a more objective way to monitor changes in your dog over time. Um, this will be completely voluntary and it's part of an add on study um, on about healthy aging among the girls dogs um, and we'll have a formal announcement about it in the next few weeks, but I just wanted to give you a brief overview. Um, so the questionnaire that we have found has been validated in multiple populations. Um, it's short and easy to fill out. And it involves you answering some questions about your dog's mobility and activity. So this is different from the physical activity section that's in the annual owner questionnaire, um, because it will ask sort of specific things about whether your dog is like stiffer in cold weather, or if they've been lying down and trying to get up, or things like how willing they are to exercise, or if they have to take breaks during exercise. So details like that, that aren't really covered in the physical activity. Um, and your dog will then receive a numerical score based on how you answer these questions. And that correlates to how affected they are by any osteoarthritis they may have. And then that information will port over to your vet and they will couple that with an actual examination of your dog. So they'll be looking at things like how stiff your dog is in a particular joint, whether there's obvious lameness when they're either standing because they're standing crooked to off weight it or when they're walking um, or if you've taken radiographs, they'll also include that information in their assessment. Um, and then the dog, the dog gets an overall score for their stage of arthritis, which will be scored from not affected all the way up to severe. And what's really cool about this is it just sort of gives you objective criteria to monitor your dog over time. So I think it's really helpful. And, you know, if your dog smiled, just helping monitor and then knowing when you're starting to uptick that maybe it's time to do an intervention or conversely, if you've done some sort of intervention to help monitor how much it's helped. So if you've done physical therapy and you see that your dog's score goes down by three points, then you know that that's really helping. Um, so I just think it's going to be a really awesome tool and I'm looking forward to it. Um, and like I mentioned, we'll have an announcement with some more details later um, and it's voluntary, but we just wanted to let you know and we hope that you'll also think that it's useful. 
Thank you. So, yes, we'd very much um, encourage you and hope that you would uh, help us in answering those questionnaires because we know about these dogs' entire lives. We're in a very good situation to really get some great data out of this. I'm just going to address a couple more questions here before I start to talk about behaviour and cognition. Uh, Karen says she had a mast cell tumour removed from her seven-year-old. Do they come back or grow elsewhere? Um, so you found another one. Well, that depends. So there are low-grade mast cell tumours and there are high-grade mast cell tumours. When the veterinary surgeon removes it, um, you should always get that sent to the pathologist. So the pathologist looks at what we call the margins and there are recommendations about how much normal tissue to remove around it. So we reduce the chances of it coming back. If it's a high grade mast cell tumor, which is a lot nastier and they're, they're actually reasonably rare, uh, then they can come back even if you think the margins are good. And we generally monitor those pretty closely. Uh, do they get other mast cell tumors? It's not uncommon uh, for some dogs to just develop multiple mast cell tumors in different places, and they just seem to be prone to it. Uh, we are actually working on mast cell tumor at the moment. We're going to be looking at the genetic information as it comes in and some of the other information because we've had a lot of low-grade mast cell tumors in this study. Um, someone else is talking, uh, Rich, about using glucosamine, glucosamine chondroitin and fish oil. Are those helpful for cancer and joint issues? Well, they're certainly thought to be helpful for joint issues. Lots of people take those uh, as well. Uh, fish oil is, is good for brain health and cognition. Julia, did you want to comment uh, any more on those since you're out there on the coal face? We'll just wait for her to be unmuted. Okay. I was like, well, let me <laughs> unmute myself. Um, yeah, I, the fish oil also is really, is helpful for joints, brain, like Janet mentioned, and also for skin. And a lot of golden retrievers suffer from skin issues. So I recommend fish oil all the time. Um, and for the glucosamine and chondroitin as well, these are protective compounds. So it's helpful to start them earlier in life. Um, I started my dog when she was sort of middle-aged, I don't know. I don't really know how old she is. So I'll say seven um, when I started her. Um, but I don't think there's any harm in starting earlier. And, and this also sort of depends on the individual dog um, and what their actual confirmation is and what, what issues they may have. But I recommend those all the time. Um, there's a lot of variability in the compounds that exist. So I would just sort of ask your vet about what they think is best and um, make sure you're getting them from a good source and not... Um, you know, some, something that's never been vetted, um, as a product, because there was some research that some of these don't have, um, you know, they say they have chondroitin in them, but then they're not actually, um, active when you test the product. So. Yeah. Just another question here, Julia, about turmeric. Uh, I, I know that's anti-inflammatory. I'm not sure I know of any specific studies in dogs on yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I know that there's been research in people. I know that there are dog products available. Um, my sister actually uses them for hers, but I'm not sure that there's been actual studies to show if they're helpful. But I think um, it's one of those that's probably not going to hurt. And yeah. if, you, if you try it and notice a difference, keep doing it. And to stay on here, uh, Karen says her mast, the mast cell tumor was low grade. So that's uh, great news. If you get good margins in those, they, they often don't come back, although it's not impossible. Uh, there's a question from Laura. What age should you start the twice a year for senior vet visits? It's probably as long as a piece of string, but what would, you, what would your guidance yeah, be? I think this is also going to depend on the dog. So, um, you know, if we're using that definition of, of seven as more of, you know, age 50 ish for people, then I think, I think seven is probably a great age to start it. But, you know, I, I have some patients that are what I call high mileage where at seven, they're looking pretty old and other patients who at my dog at seven was still completely wild. And so I didn't really start the twice yearly visits for her until more recently. 
Great. I think we've now caught up with the questions in the chat. Uh, so I just want to change the topic a little bit now. Um, of course, you know that we have the behavioural questionnaire that you fill out every year, but I wanted to talk specifically about cognition and just give you a definition of cognition. So that refers to mental processes and gaining knowledge and comprehension. So when we're talking about cognitive processes, we're talking about things like thinking and knowing, remembering, making judgments and solving problems. And those of us who are getting on a little bit, of course, all know that some minor changes are quite normal with age. So we have these senior moments and, you know, that's just all part of the wonderful process of entering our golden years. Uh, but, you know, it can, of course, become more serious. And we do have in dogs uh, cognitive dysfunction syndrome, which is very, very similar to Alzheimer's disease in people. So how common is that? Some estimates are that up to 35% of aging dogs have this. In one study, it was 28% of 11 to 12-year-old dogs and 68% of dogs 15 to 16 years. But these figures are really about all dogs. And, you know, we really don't have accurate figures on that. It is useful to be breed specific. So what we do know, it is very common, uh, but we would really like to know what happens to the cognition of golden retrievers as they age? What things would we consider normal? What things would we consider worrying? The classical signs of canine cognitive dysfunction syndrome are summarized by the acronym DISHA, D-I-S-H-A, which refers to the signs that we see, which include disorientation, alterations and in interactions with owners, other pets and their environment, sleep-wake cycle disturbances, house soiling and changes in activity. So I did have a very personal experience with this with my dog, Satu. Some of you asked me some questions when I first became CSO a couple of years ago. And so you would have seen my photo of, of Satu, who was actually an osteosarcoma survivor. Uh, so he was a, a three-legged boy from about 10 years of age. And it was around about that time we started noticing changes in his behavior that we really had put down to him being an amputee and maybe being a little bit anxious, but he was definitely reacting a lot more than he had before. He'd, he'd always been an anxious dog. He was trying to kind of snap at people, not for, for much of a reason. Uh, and then, you know, this kind of played out over around about three years. So definitely his energy levels really plummeted. That was probably the next sign. Uh, and then, um, you know, we had, we had the energy, we had the kind of strange behavior, the sleep-wake cycle. So finding him, you know, running around whining in the middle of the night, this is pretty typical kind of uh, behavior. He always recognized who we were, Um but, you know, things about Satu and the way he had been definitely changed a lot. And right towards the end, we were dealing with house soiling and so forth. And it took us actually a really long time to realize what was going on because it happens very gradually. Um, you kind of forget how the dog was before. And my sister kind of came to visit and said, oh, this, this really seems very abnormal. Um, what, we, what you really have to do with this sort of thing, though, is rule out other things. So osteoarthritis, that pain, as I said before, that can affect cognition. Older dogs may very well have hearing or sight problems that's altering the way that they're interacting with you, or they may be unwell for other reasons. So this is something to definitely be aware of, that it's very common as dogs become older, but it's almost a diagnosis of exclusion. We're having to rule other things out. There are some things that are just very, very diagnostic for it. So sometimes I would find Satu in a closet or in a corner. They start to lose their ability to get around obstacles and so forth. So really finding this early, ruling out other causes, um, because there are things that you can do. Uh, there has, for example, been some evidence that medium chain triglycerides 
uh, can help that brain get it get energy and then can in some dogs uh, make the symptoms less severe. Again, if you have things like this, I would consult with your own veterinary surgeon. Um, but what we want to do is help you guys with this. So we are going to put some questions on, in on cognition as well and cognitive dysfunction syndrome. It's not a massively long questionnaire, so this will be added with the uh, osteoarthritis one. So I just wanted Julia to uh, come on and just give you a few details. But I, as someone who's had a dog like this, I wish I could have picked it up early when I could have done more. So uh, very keen to see people participating in this. Yeah, thanks. So uh, yeah, like Janet mentioned, um, we've heard from many of you that you're also interested in trying to make sure your seniors are, are alert for as long as possible. And so we research tools to help monitor this. Um, and so along with that osteoarthritis questionnaire that I mentioned, um, we will also launch a questionnaire to monitor behavioral changes in senior pups. Um, and this will be different from the CBARC that you're already filling out because it's more focused on these specific cognitive changes. Um, and as Janet discussed, these can be really hard to detect in our dogs and dif difficult to differentiate from pain and other problems. So that's why we think it's really important to do it in conjunction with the osteoarthritis questionnaire. Um, and the questionnaire is very short and it asks about those DISHA things that Janet said. So confusion, altered social interaction, um, anxiety, sleep patterns, focus and memory. Um, and then there's also a vet component that mirrors the owner component so that you can better facilitate conversations with your vet and make sure that changes are addressed early. And I think this piece is really important because it gives us this language to know. And so I actually just went through this with my sister where so like Janet, I came to visit and I was like, your dog is not normal. And she had, she kept going to the vet, but she didn't have the right language. And so vets just kept being like, oh, I think it's anxiety, but she wasn't mentioning that her dog was getting lost in corners, which is a very key thing to cognitive dysfunction as opposed to anxiety. And so helping have the terminology and knowing specific things to look for are really useful. And what I didn't mention with the osteoarthritis questionnaire is that we do really recommend doing these every six months because our dogs are changing so rapidly as they age. Um, so we won't require a six month vet visit, but the questionnaire would be great to fill out twice a year. And of course, if you do notice a meaningful change and you're concerned, you should you should go to the vet. It's just that we're not gonna be requiring that visit. Um, and so this is also voluntary, but we really hope that you'll find it valuable and helpful. And I know just looking through this questionnaire has made me really think about my dog's behavior differently and notice some things that I otherwise probably would have brushed off. Um, so for example, a couple of times recently I've called her name when she can't see me and she goes the wrong direction. And so whether that's a hearing problem or if it's true disorientation, I, I don't know for sure, but this really helps me um, just bring awareness to it and monitor it more closely so that I can make changes sooner if something seems like it's worsening. And so that's, you know, I've done this whole questionnaire for her and that's one of the only things that really picks up. So I don't think that she has, you know, severe cognitive decline at this point, but it helps me put a score to it so that I can look at whether she's worsening or anything like that. So just be on the lookout for this new tool and we'll, we'll definitely send something out soon to give you some more information about both of these. Yeah, that was a good point, Julia. And certainly when I was dealing with Satu, um, it helped us to have a tool like that. So we did kind of score and uh, see if things had changed, you know, over the previous few months and whether his quality of life um, was altering. Susan here says, I found training tricks in my eight-year-old golden is really beneficial and yeah older dogs can still learn there's plenty of evidence for that and you know this is very similar to Alzheimer's disease in people we have very similar brain biology so those sort of things making sure even if the dog's losing energy just some walking getting out there getting some social interaction um, you know, little puzzle games for dogs, keeping their minds active as they're getting older, not thinking, you know, this uh, old dogs can can learn new tricks, right? That, that old saying uh, <laughs> isn't exactly accurate. So old dogs can learn new tricks and it's good to keep them going. Um, and this, would, this questionnaire will be very helpful for you to monitor. Uh, and another question here. My eight and a half year old has started to whine a lot and be more vocal. Would you think that is, that is a cognition issue? Well, possibly. Uh, so as we were talking about, 
there can be a number of different reasons. And if you're worried and it's new and it's a change, then you should uh, take the dog to your veterinarian. Okay, someone's saying, will these questionnaires be available to use even if my golden retriever is not in the study? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would like us to be able to do that, but let's, uh, we'll have to talk behind the scenes about that because I do think it's very useful for people to be aware and be able to use them. Uh, that said, the, the DISH uh, uh, cognitive dysfunction questionnaire is pretty readily available online. Uh, it's not just specific to us. Okay, so I just really like to thank everyone for interacting um, with us today. I just also wanted to give you a quick update on the genotyping. So this is the genetic testing. Many, if not all of you are probably aware, a while ago we asked for golden oldies participants. These have been golden retrievers over the age of 12 who have not succumbed to cancer because we needed some controls. We had an incredible response. Um, within just a few weeks, we had enough dogs who had signed up. Uh, so I'm pleased to say uh, we picked out 200 samples from those dogs. That DNA was isolated and is now safely at the laboratory, being mixed with all of the girls' samples. Uh, ready to be sent for testing, which we think will happen before the end of March. And then we have a lot of data to cope with uh, and analyze. The golden oldie samples are being kept um, at North Carolina State University, and we're going to be in the future making those available to researchers uh, who would like to use those samples. And that will probably include us uh, at various points. So very exciting. Soon we will have... Uh, all of the dogs genotyped within the next few months. And then we're looking forward to seeing where that goes scientifically. Um, so once again, thank you everyone uh, for coming. We're going to have some more of these calls. We'd love your feedback on how you found this one. Uh, we're going to be looking at a number of topics this year. It will in include nutrition, I promise. I realise that that is uh, something people are very concerned about. And so am I as a pet owner myself. Uh, so I hope you all have a great day. Thank you very much. Uh, it was good to see so many people in the middle of uh, in the middle of the day taking the time.